Hello. Welcome. So my name is Wendy Powley and I'm a faculty member at the School of Computing at Queen's University and I'm the founder of the Canadian Celebration of Women in Computing. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2020 COVID edition of CanQuick. In name, this is the fifth CanQuick conference. However, in reality, it's actually our 10th anniversary this year. We were originally the Ontario Celebration of Women in Computing and we transitioned to a national event um, in 2015. We'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us. And we hope that next year we'll be able to gather in person to continue building community, making connections, meeting new friends, and to emerge from that conference energized, inspired, and ready to take on the world. CanQuick is possible through partnership of the ACM and CSCAN InfoCAN, and is supported by many comp comp corporate sponsors. I'd like to thank our sponsors who've contributed to support this event and the many, many of them have been with us for the 10 years that the conference has been running. I wanna make sure that you check out the events that our corporate sponsors are running today. I'll go over those at the end of the, the keynote speech today. Uh, despite COVID, most of our corporate sponsors are still hiring and they're looking for excellent talent, just like you. These sessions that you can uh, get to today are a great way to connect with corporate partners and um, to connect with them in a small group setting. Consider uploading your resume as well because they're looking for talent. So despite the fact that we say our resumes were due a couple of days ago, there's still time to submit your resume. So upload that on the CanQuick website. Okay, the general schedule, we're having our keynote right now till two o'clock. We have some corporate, corporate partners doing some sessions after that. And then a panel session at three o'clock today. So I hope you, hope you join us for the second event of the day and the corporate sponsor sessions as well. Tomorrow we have a cybersecurity speaker um, starting at one o'clock. Uh, we're also doing a random draw for a new book that is hot off the press called Please Stay, How Women in Tech Survive and Thrive by Kelly Irwin and Deborah Christmas. Kelly was an early supporter of CanQuick through her role at TD and has continued to support the conference through the years. If you're a winner, we'll contact you via email to get your mailing address. Okay, we're gonna begin the keynote shortly. For the keynote, everybody's going to remain on mute. Um, please use the chat function. Um, down at the bottom, you'll see Q&A and chat. Please use the chat if you have questions for the keynote speaker. We're going to have plenty of time at the end for, the, for questions. So please put your questions there and we'll have lots of time for you to chat with our keynote speaker. Okay, so I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Maria radulovic Mastic. Maria is Senior Vice President of Development Technology and Services at Electronic Arts. She's responsible for all aspects of technology within EA Studios organization, ranging from long-term technology strategy to short-term execution and risk mitigation plans. Maria also leads EA's shared development services portfolio where she is responsible for a vital global team composed of quality verification, data analytics and insights, quality engineering and central operations. Maria has, let, has held various leadership roles, including director, creative services and senior development director responsible, responsible for EA's global technology develop in, development in North America. Before joining trans, the transformative and challenging gaming industry, Maria spent 10 years in business software development where she held several positions from software engineering and technical sales to Director of Program Management. Maria graduated from the University of Belgrade where she studied electrical engineering and computer science and she holds a master's degree in electrical engineering. Maria, thank you so much for joining us today and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Wendy. So, hello everyone uh, and good morning from the West Coast and good afternoon to the East Coast. So I'm thrilled to be speaking with you today. So yes, my name is Marie, Maria radulovic Nastic, and I'm Senior Vice President of Development Technology and Electronic Arts. So I've been with EA uh, approximately 16 years in a variety of roles, and many of them involving tech. So technology and empowering women in technology is very near dear to my heart, and it's critical to the successes of many industries, including gaming. So I don't know will I be able to express my passion through the Zoom for this topic, but I'll try. So bear with me. So a little bit of electronic, about Electronic Arts to start with. So Electronic Arts is one of the world's biggest game uh, publisher and developer. 
and has a long and personal history in Canada. It's founded 1982 in US and expanded in Canada in 1991. What we know today as electronic arts uh, has been fueled and built by Canadian talent. And I'm just thrilled that we are only continue to grow our presence in Canada. We now have more than 2,600 people on several campuses across the country. EA Canada is home of some of the largest interactive development studios in the world. And about one third of our workforce calls uh, Canada home. It's a huge source of talent for EA. So I don't know how many of you are gamers or call yourself gamers, but you may have heard of a few of our studios and their games. EA Vancouver, uh, when I'm in the office, that's where my office is home to FIFA, UFC, NHL, Plants vs. Zombies, Gates, and more. Then we have Bioware in Edmonton, home to Mass Effect and Dragon Age, and also Motive in Montreal, home to the recently launched Star Wars Squadrons. Canada is also a center of excellence for EA Global Gaming Technology, including development of our proprietary game engine and digital platform. So um, I'm proud today to join you as one of the most senior women in technology and gaming industry. And that statement is a natural in some, in, in many ways still uncomfortable for me to say. But as a woman, I believe we need to own our accomplishments, especially the hard fought ones and stop apologizing for our success. To succeed in this male-dominated industry, we must create more environments that welcome different opinions and make space for new perspectives. Inclusive environments don't just happen. They must be created, cultivated, and championed. And that's where champions come in. I have been incredibly fortunate to have some strong champions guide and support me through my career. It's unusual for the gaming industry to have a woman on a position of leading technology. But executive team in Electronic Arts has been a great champions. They constantly create a space for my voice to be heard and they listen to the perspectives that they can bring to the table. So although the tech industry has come a long way since I started my career, there is still so much we need to do to put women at the forefront uh, of the tech and entertainment companies. But make no mistake, women have always been here. They might have been, they might have been overlooked, but women has always been a driving force of cutting edge technology, pioneering new solutions and shaping transform transformative industries like gaming for decades. So part of what's so special about this conference and many conferences like this is that it bring women in technology into spotlight, ensuring that contributions of women are not just valued, but celebrated and creating opportunity, opportunities for warm women to follow in their footsteps. So today I'd like to honor these pioneering women and shed a light on the incredible technical contributions they made to gaming, tech, and the world as we know. So you likely know Katherine Johnson from the Hidden Figure, uh, Figures movie. Uh, I don't know, have you seen that movie? But if you didn't, I highly recommend it. Today, I want to introduce you to some other incredible women, specifically those from Canada who have propelled our industry forward. So going back all the way to 1930s, Elsie Gregory McGill, Elsie, known as the queen of hurricanes, was the first world woman, a, 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 a woman to earn an aeronautical engineering degree and was the first woman in Canada to receive bachelor degree in electrical engineering. She worked as a, a aeronautical engineer during the second world war and did much to make Canada a powerhouse of aircraft, uh, aircraft uh, construction. 1940s, Beatrice Worsley. Beatrice Rixie Helen Worsley was the first female computer scientist in Canada. 
She wrote the first program to run on EdSAC, co-wrote the first compiler for Toronto's Vera, Vera Anti Mark I, wrote numerous papers in computer science, and taught computers and engineering at Queen's University and University of Toronto for over 20 years. 1940s, 1950s, Hedy Lamar. So this is a bit unconventional and counterintuitive choice. She's not Canadian and she's not a game developer for sure, but it's a fascinating figure. Hollywood actress Hedy Lamar was also an avid inventor and the person behind advances in communication technology in the 1940s that led today Wi Fi, GPS, and Bluetooth. The movie star might be most well known for her roles in Oscar nominated films, but it is actually her technical mind that is her greatest legacy. So, 1970s, Carol Shaw, one of the early female pioneers in gaming. Carol was the first woman ever to get her name on the game box. Carol's 3D tic tac toe became the first commercially re uh, released game, video game designed by women. She did the programming, sound, and graphics herself. Her second game, a game, River Aid, won several awards, including Best Atari 8 Bit Game of the Year. 1990s, Muriel Rami, a French video game designer from Martinique, who is considered the first black game designer. Muriel has written and directed several adventure games and co-created the Goblin series. She was also involved in creation of educational software and video games for school children and college students. And then 2000, Mariam Mirzakhani. She's not Canadian and she's not an engineer, but I remember crying when she died. She died at the age of 40, thinking that one of the best women mathematicians of all time died too much prematurely. She was an Iranian mathematician and professor of mathematics at Stanford University. She was honored for her innovative research by popular science as a brilliant 10, where she was acknowledged as one of the top 10 young minds who pushed their fields in innovative directions. And also she received the Fields Medal the most prestigious mathematics award, where she became the first and to date the only woman and the first Iranian to be honored with this reward. So we all stand on the shoulders of these giants. Today, I feel encouraged when I look at the faces of my colleagues at EA. So those are the faces <laughs> of my colleagues. We have so many incredible women powering our technology and video games industry. We are making encouraging steps and I'm really proud to work alongside so many talented colleagues every day. So continuing with the notion of hidden and overlooked, in this case numbers, I want to draw your attention to in ideal world, 50% of our tech talent would be women. But unfortunately we have work to do. Today, only one in three Canadian with STEM degrees are women. The number of women in computer science is rising, but the percentage of women in computer science is still behind. And these challenges translate to the workplace. So women are still only 22% of the science, technology, engineering, and math, math work, work, uh, uh, force. And in 2020, the world has confronted historical inequalities in a profound new ways. The pandemic has shown us how stubborn traditional gender roles can be. So experts are warning that these challenges could be worsened as women try to balance work from home and fam family challenges caused by pandemic. 80% of working mothers are primarily handling the online learning the responsibilities of their children. 1.5 million Canadian women lost their jobs during the first two months of the pandemic. And in the beginning, it was kind of evenly split between men and women. 
but it is in the reopening where we have started to see a divergence. Men are getting rehired faster as certain industries get back to their feet. Whereas women have been rehired, but the gap is bigger and there is still 1 million fewer women working, a level not seen since 1986. We cannot afford to lose momentum or to have our hard fought progress reversed. So some days these challenges can feel overwhelming or even bleak, but I'm personally an internal optimist. I've seen the incredible ways that the companies and communities have risen to overcome so many crises this year. And I believe we can turn these challenges into opportunities. There are important revelations we made this year that could help create more opportunities for women and bring valuable new vo voices and talent into our industry. So what lessons have we and can we continue to learn from working at home? How can we use the remote work revolution to advance our movement? Create flexible or hybrid schedules for everyone making it easier to manage, manage a family schedule. Asynchronous workflows that allow people to meet the workload and thrive on their own terms. More equitable meetings. Make sure that all voices are heard. Equal access where we all at the same level. <clears throat> so when you don't have a a physical locations with more boys of the club, it's much easier to reach out to everyone and provide opportunity for all. So these moves would not only prevent women from falling behind during pandemic, but create a more level playing field for our industry in the future. So as a leader in EA, one of my main responsibilities and probably my favorite responsibility is to attract and retain the best tech talent in gaming. And that cannot happen without truly diverse team that matches our diverse player base and has unique ideas and work styles. So now more than ever, I have to find ways to elevate and accelerate more women into tech, gaming and engineering. And now more than ever, we need to be allies to each other. So to me, allyship is about showing up and advocating, advocating for others. But above else, allyship is about driving real action and change. I believe there is an ally in everyone. And I challenge each and every one of us here today to think about how we can be doing more to advance other women. So all of us in this virtual room care so much about the work, the studies that we do. But my challenge to you is this. Make sure you pick an environment that cares much about you as you do about your work. So if there is only one takeaway for me from my talk today, this is it. Find a place where your voice is honored and valued and use your voice to help bring others along. Finding our voice is so important as we carve our careers in the male dominated fields, whatever is a tech or gaming, we must continue to make our voice heard. For so long, women were told what to say, how to act and what career to have. But even as we break out of these molds, many of us continue to feel the pressure to fit in. To fit in with your male colleagues, to adapt to tech culture and to maintain the status quo. And I'm here today to tell you that it's time to stop fitting in. Embrace your difference. The value that every single one of you brings to the tech industry is actually being different. Your perspective, your experience, and all the ways you don't fit in are, is, are actually incredibly valuable and have the power to transform our tech industry for the better. So creating more opportunities for women in tech is all our responsibility. With that said, 
Electronic Arts is always looking for the great talent, especially here in Canada. So if you see yourself joining us in transforming the gaming industry for the better, I encourage you to keep an eye on openings in EA. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. Thank you, Maria, for a really inspirational talk. I'd love to um, open the uh, floor to questions. And if you have questions for Maria, please go ahead and put them in the chat. My name is Adele Newton. I'm the executive director of CSCAN InfoCAN, one of the presenters of this conference. And I'm happy to be here to um, facilitate questions until we get some on in the chat. Um, I, I have one of my own uh, for Maria, and that's what advice do you have for women who want to get into this industry? So, um, I mean, that's the question that we also often heard. So first of all, as I said, uh, I think that finding uh, your passion, first of all, I, I mean, gaming in this industry is making games is fun for living, but making games is not easy. So it has to be your passion. And then when you decide and you realize that this, it is your passion, don't fit in. Like that's my, my message. Like don't try to fit in. Embrace your difference and know that your difference and your voice uh, are bringing something invaluable uh, to the table. And this is such a different message that we have heard over the years from our, our male colleagues and even our female colleagues. It, you know, those of us who are old enough to remember the 80s when women were told how to dress in the workplace, we were in fact told how to dress almost as men. So I have a note here for someone saying all the ways you don't, to quote you, all the ways you don't fit in are incredibly valuable. Lo Wowzers, I love that. So uh, we have a question here. How do I make myself stand out in the tech industry? Uh, again, very similar message. It's like basically uh, uh, embrace the fact that your experiences, your point of view are different and never, never, never uh, uh, question your, your ability to not just stand up, but be equal and better than your male colleagues. Another question here, what's the best way to get your foot in the door? Is it to get a co-op job? Is it to submit your resume? What's the best way to talk to you? So, so uh, generally the best way is to start with co-op opportunities with EA. Like EA um, um, have many co-op opportunities every year. Uh, but once when, when somebody is already in a, in a workforce, then yes, take a look of our career uh, website. There is a lot of interesting opportunities across Canada. Uh, submit your resume, reach to us, and uh, let's talk. Um, are you, and this is a good segue, another question here. What are the different kinds of jobs available in the gaming industry? Are they all tech? Are there other types of jobs as well? Yeah. So um, one thing that I love, one of many things that I love about gaming industry, it's that interesting intersection between art and engineering. Um, so we do have a lot of jobs that are basically like the designers, artists, as well as, uh, of course, software engineers. Uh, everything that we do expresses itself in software. So, so uh, of course, um, in every gaming company, same as EA, you'll find a lot of software engineers, but that's not all. There are designers, there are storytellers, there are art, uh, arts. Yeah, I was going to ask you about storytellers because especially in, 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 a, in an industry like gaming, you must have to have people who know how to tell stories, who know how to illustrate stories. So those are also important and valuable skills for people to have. Um, do you need a portfolio in the gaming industry to get a co-op job or an internship? Uh, the portfolio always, uh, always helps for sure. Is it absolutely must? It's not, but it helps. And, and you know, having one will help in a career in general. So I would always encourage to have one. Right. Um, sorry, my computer is doing some funny things here. 
Um, here's a question. I never know when I'm ready for a job. I'm a second year student. I really don't know if I'm good enough to compare to the other developers out there. And so I've been hesitating to apply. And I think this is a particularly interesting question for you, Maria, because you talked about not dismissing your accomplishments. So I'd love to get your view on that. Yeah, so it's, uh, I think that uh, that everyone feels like that from time to time, like regardless, regardless what's your role and how much experience you have. Sometimes we feel that, you know, you're not maybe good enough and, uh, but if ever possible, let's try to put those feelings on the side and, and accept, accept the fact that you've been successful, that, you know, like that we are successful and try not to apologize for our successes. I think even being in a program in university means that you're successful to what you've been doing so far and to not dismiss that, that, you know, there are things coming forward and this is what you talked about to not dismiss those successes. I really liked what you had to say about champions and allyship and mentorship. Um, so what does it look like in today's workplace at EA? What does allyship look like there? Yeah, so so we um, have a, something that we call Women's Ultimate Team, uh, which is basically employee resource group uh, for underrepresented talent. And unfortunately, in gaming, women are still underrepresented talent. Uh, so, so as a part of a Women's Ultimate Team, we also reach out to our male colleagues to make sure that they understand that we accept that we expect them to be allies in the workplace. So what does it mean? It means opening a space for every voice to be heard and constantly, like consciously making sure that even like we always say that sometimes you have uh, in the same team people that like to talk more or more extrovert or you have introverts or people that more that sometimes more question their all their own um, uh, skills or capability, you have to make sure that every single voice is heard. And if bringing different perspective, then even better. Is that a different way of working for most people? It is. It, it does not come natural to many people. Like it's, yes. That's why I said, like, we have, we put the program in place where we have to, like, work with our work, not just with women, but our male colleagues to, to remind them and teach them how to be an ally. Like, and you know, no, nobody's perfect, per, uh, perfect. Sometimes we make mistakes, but as far as we try, it's good. There's a question here that I find really interesting. And that's what, would, what can people do outside of their studies at university to gain valuable experience for uh, working in, a, in the gaming industry, for example, or any other, workplace uh, are there any is there any advice you can give about other ways to um to make yourself a valuable addition to a company uh, i'm a big fan of co-ops and internships i think that uh, it's actually uh, great to for employer have access to to, to to some top talent but also uh for students to learn about companies and to make sure that those environments that you want to apply and work for, the, for those environments, going back to what I said, that we need, we need always to pick environment that values and honors our opinions. If that's not the case, then go, don't go there. Don't give a gift of your talent to somebody who does not value it. It's interesting. I gave that very advice to somebody yesterday, and it's very important because if you're not happy, you will not do good work and you will just be miserable. And there's no reason to undervalue, to have yourself undervalued. Um, this, this is an interesting question. Uh, are there any hiring biases in the gaming industry if you are an underrepresented minority? So uh, we absolutely don't want that to happen. Um, does it happen as a part of unconscious bias sometimes? sometimes? Yes, it does. And I think that we need to, 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 to be kind of, ex, ex, not accept, but realize that we are not perfect and we continue need to work towards that. We have, we spend a lot of efforts trying to 
even make our, our job postings, uh, write them in a way that we do not bias uh, uh, under, underrepresented talent. Uh, we also, within games, um, have a way um, of like a framework that help us looking the content on the game so that, that we make sure um, we include diverse, that, that, that we have a diversity with the game, games. But for hiring pur uh, purposes, a lot of effort to make job postings um, attractive for uh, unrepresented talent, the same as everybody else, as well uh, during hiring. Like we have for engineers uh, always uh, the rule that when you are interviewed by the panel, that one of the panel, uh, members of the panel needs to be a woman. Um, so a lot of efforts to, to remove the biases that existed in the, in the past. How about, how about biases? Uh, I think the question was actually about yes. biases towards non-minority or uh, participants, such as white males. That's, I was just going to clarify, Wendy. Oh, okay. I'll okay. speak against that. Yeah, it's okay. Um, no, I don't think that there is a necessarily a bias because what I just said is, is, is meant to be uh, uh, really removing any bias rather than, than creating a bias towards, towards uh, unrepresented talent. Uh, but if you look at gaming industry, um, majority, vast majority is still white male. So there is no, there is no necessarily bias. <laughs> There's a question here that's interesting. During an interview, is it okay to bring up my struggles as a woman in tech when an interviewer asks about the struggles you have faced? Uh, I think it's very honest. I mean, again, going back, be who you are. Like I, I really believe that the best advice is like be who you are and 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 you know. If, if they don't believe that, that this is something that, that they are, that they value who you are, then don't go there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I know it's hard, and especially with the imposter syndrome that we all suffer. And I am firmly convinced that we all have this issue of an imposter syndrome, regardless of whether it's someone in your position or someone who's going for a job interview. It's, it's an... Um, it's a temptation to, you know, to not reveal yourself. And yeah. so, but that was another question. Do you, do, does every, does anyone ever um, uh, defeat that imposter syndrome? I, I think that we just learn how to live with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I, I, everybody, everybody feels it. And I think that when you realize that everybody from time to time uh, feels it, then, then it's kind of easier. <laughs> it never goes away. You just become more comfortable with it. <laughs> we have someone who anonymously asked the question, um, if you have advice you would give to women who want to create their own business in the technology industry. So um, I have to admit, I don't have a uh, entrepreneur's experience. So I spend majority of my career in a, in a bigger uh, corporation. Uh, but I think that, that uh, uh, having more companies in tech led by women, women is invaluable. And I think would, so if you have an idea, I would say go for it. Like as an employer, when we hire people, we actually really um, value uh, uh, experience with somebody trying to, 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 to have their business and they may be going back to corporate, then going back to business. So my advice would be go for it. You um, have at, at uh, EA mentorship programs for um, younger women who are perhaps in high school or in university where your, where your employees go out and, and mentor people. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I was, um, uh, it was now some time ago, so mentor from some U for some UBC students, and that was incredibly rewarding experience for me. So um, I always advise my um, um, se more senior colleagues to actively go for that experience. It's, it's giving back, but it's also very enriching personal experience. Yeah. 
Um, someone here was asking about mentorship programs and how they can find a mentor. And I can tell you from our experience, um, I work with uh, on the board of Women in Communications and Technology. That organization, which is nationwide, has mentorship programs. I know a lot of companies like EA, which is why I asked you the question, have those kind of um, mentorship programs. So I think you have to search out and find those champions. And, um, and they are rewarding experiences for those, for both sides, for the mentors and the mentees. That's right. Um, I'm just looking to see. Okay, as someone with a learning disability, I'm never sure if I should state I have one on the applications. Is it better to be open about it or to not share it? So I'm all for being open. Um, and I think that, that um, um, you know, when we talk about diversity and inclusion and different experiences, that goes all the way. So, so, so absolutely, I would say be open. Does this diversity, is the intention, I think I know the answer to this question, for the diversity in hiring to be reflected in the games that are produced and in the audiences they will reach? Yes, that's absolutely. Um, and I, I, again, it's my personal opinion, but I don't think that gaming industry can be successful in the future if we don't represent our global player. And our global player is very diverse. Uh, you know, the time of, of, of typical gamer being demographics of, let's say, male from 12 to 35 is long gone. The biggest growth in gaming industry is actually mobile and, 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 and majority of, of mobile gaming players are more women. Interesting. Do you think grad school is valuable for people to, uh, pursuing uh, a career in this industry? Grad schools are always valuable, like no doubt about it. Is that the only way to go? No, no, but um, are they valuable? Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm looking at these questions and there, there's such a broad range. What are the opportunities for people who come from the natural sciences background, like physics, chemistry, biology? In gaming? Yes. We do have, we do have uh, people with different backgrounds, for sure. Um, I can, I'm now thinking, um, do I have a specific example of any of my uh, colleagues from uh, the National Science? So I, I don't have a specific example, but definitely we do, we do have majority of though our computer science and engineering. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, and that, that doesn't surprise me because you're looking for software engineers to develop, correct? But, you know. Um, a un Here's a question, I'm going to read it. A unique problem for underrepresented people in tech is the problem of access to useful technology and an internet connection. Often people who are a minority in the industry simply because their family was fortunate enough to foster an in interest in technology at a young age. Um, how, do, how does EA address this, this issue of not everyone having the same access to technology and, and making sure that that diversity is is in is uh, taken care of. So um, uh, the access of technology from the infrastructure point of view, um, I, 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 I can tell you from the technical point of view. Like we try to, whenever we develop games, uh, uh, to to look at for the uh, the least uh, 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 the, the, the the specs that are that are the lowest possible, if so that you can actually play those games games on the different level of hardware's hardware um so but the reality is that in order in today's world to play many games you need wi-fi connection yes uh, there are still games that you can play um if you don't have wi-fi connection more as a single player um as a as a story-based game when it's not multiplayers uh, but today, majority of like we we, we almost expect Wi Fi. Yes. Uh, which is, I agree, can be a challenge on its own. Yes, thanks. This this is a question that I, I remember my son having this question. If I want to go to grad school, would you suggest waiting a few years after undergrad, um, or knowing, um, or, or or waiting a little bit to, uh, or going directly after undergrad, or waiting a little bit to get some experience before going to graduate school. 
Uh, I would say yes. Like I think that that sometimes, like often, it's better to understand work environment environment before uh, going further. So I, I usually give an ex uh, give an advice to wait a couple of years, understand. Uh, again, what's your 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 path? What's your passion? And then go back to school. However, I mean that's again not the only path. It can be directly from school to school. Wendy, do you have any other questions that oh, you would like to um, pose I, to Maria? Thank you, Adele. So I do have a question, Maria. So one thing that I hear from our female students uh, quite often is that they're really encouraged to do hackathons, do projects outside of school, um, you know, basically live and breathe computing. Is it possible to have a career at EA without being an avid gamer and without having this passion that you want to code in your sleep at night? Is it possible to have just a career in gaming? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, um, being an avid gamer is more, you need to love making games. If you don't like making games, then gaming company might not be the right place for you. Uh, but do you need to be hardcore gamer in order to work for EA? No. And it's interesting when I was talking about uh, making sure that our job postings um, are more um, open for diverse pool of talent and attractive for diverse per, uh, pool of talent. One of the things that we, what we were removing was, was actually that line that you need to be a hardcore gamer or gamer. So I would say yes. Um, but um, if you don't like games, <laughs> not the place for you. <laughs> The point that I wanted to get across, though, I think, is that computer science and programming and jobs in the tech industry are jobs. They're not something that you have to live and breathe. You don't have to go home and do your job at home all night long. And if you don't do that, you don't belong. This is, this is the sort of, I guess, impression that a lot of the girls have because they see people doing hackathons and they see people doing all of these projects outside and they think, oh, well, you know, I don't really want to do that. Therefore, I'm not good enough to go to the tech industry. Yeah. They, I, so I actually you know what it's, it's when you pose a question like that, not EA, in general in tech industry, don't let your job completely take over your life. Like that's not, it's not a healthy situation to be regardless, regardless if it's EA or any tech. I think a lot of people feel like they shouldn't apply if you're not that hard, hardcore computer scientist. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the thing that I took most from this talk is your passion, Maria, for um, for the work that you do, but also in sharing the accomplishments of women and having women succeed by mentorship and, and allyship and championing them. Um, also, your your ongoing message of be yourself because your diversity, what you bring to a table of being different is actually valuable. It's not a problem. It's, it's not a bug, it's a feature, as they used to say <laughs> in uh, early days of programming. And I think that that's a message that we don't hear often enough as, as women, if at all. Um, and so I want to thank you for that it, and also for sharing with us those stories of women who, whose shoulders we stand upon when you, uh, when you showed the slide of the different women over the years who have really um, formed the basis for our ability to, to thrive in this industry. So um, I want to thank you on behalf of CSCAN, ACMW, and CanQuick for your really inspirational talk. I, I, I think that it's not what I expected. Uh, it's so much better than what I expected. And your message of not uh, living and breathing work is also an important one that we have to hear over and over again. Yeah, so there was a, if you don't mind me, I'm looking at the chat and there is a lot of questions about work-life balance and, and work-life balance uh, in a gaming company. So um, if you don't mind, I-, I Oh, please, I, yeah. Because it's something that we hear very often. Um, 
And the reality is in the beginning of gaming and industry, it was a, a bit, or, or, you know, like let's say 15, 20 years ago was off. Uh, we did have a situations where, um, you know, people were like basically fainting out of exhaustion. Uh, at that time, for at least I can talk about BA being six months, six years, 16 years there, uh, that time is not anymore like that. It's, it's we put so much um, processes in the game development, like uh, uh, the traditional project management processes to ensure that we don't end up in situation when people need to work 20 hours per day per day uh, on a prolonged period of time. So um, um, I really don't believe it's like that anymore. Uh, game development is not easy and you always have maybe a couple of weeks before the game gets released at crunch time, but crunch time for EA is not normal. Like we do not plan for crunch time and we try really uh, consciously to avoid a uh, 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 at any cost. Because what we learn is if you, if you really burn out your team, you'll need a lot of time for them to recover. So your next game will be late and it's a vicious cycle. So rather than have that vicious cycle, cycle going on and on, uh, the idea is like do everything trying to avoid crunch time. Uh, and you know, there's a question, there's a thing here about burnout in game development. And sadly, I have to say that it's not unique to game development. Burnout is, it happens in every field and not every company has understood, has come to understand what EA clearly has that burning out your people means burning out your best resource. And if you lose your people, you no longer have a product to put out there. So, um, but sadly, it's not unique to, to this industry. It's, it happens everywhere. And the danger, I think, as we work at home is that people cannot find the, the line between working and not working because you're not traveling back and forth to an office. So how, how has EA handled that in the in COVID? Uh, yeah, I think that that we are we are constantly in a learning peri period, like really uh, trying to adjust. Uh, but we realize exactly what you just said that that not having opportunity to separate your wife uh, life and your work is burning out people additionally. So what we are doing is trying to, to really consciously put uh, days when, uh, for example, you're not gonna have meetings. So you will not, we don't have that constant Zoom presence on Zoom. We are really encouraging uh, uh, people to take vacation because what we learned this year, uh, um, people are taking way less vacation because they, they, we can travel, we can go anywhere. So uh, encouraging people to do that. Also encouraging teams to block lighter weeks when we cancel all non-essential meetings and try to encourage people as much as possible to take time uh, from themselves. And then, as I said, most importantly, when we plan our projects, make sure that we do not plan for people working so much over time that burn out. You burn them out, yeah. Um, <laughs> so so um, for the young women who are in the audience now who are listening to you and being inspired by you, what would be your, um, your final word to them in terms of looking for what they'll be doing in the future and how to get there? Uh, so first, I would love to see more, more, more uh, women in tech, and I would love to see more women in gaming industry. So please consider gaming industry as your as your career. Um, again, going back is do not try to fit in. Embrace your difference, difference, and know that that difference is actually value that you are bringing to the table. I think that's wonderful advice, and I, I really thank you. I'm going to pass the baton to Wendy to uh, close us out. 
And, uh, and again, Maria, from me personally and from all the organizations, thank you so very much and all the, on all the participants today. Thank you so very much for a really inspirational talk. Wendy? Thank you. Thank you, Adele. Thank you so much, Maria. I'm just going to share my screen here and bring up some slides. Can you see my slides, Adele? Yes, I can. I had to unmute myself. Yes, I can. <laughs> I don't know if I can get rid of this, I guess. So, okay. So just a couple of things to end off with. Um, uh, my slides don't want to change for me. Okay. Again, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Um, these are companies that sponsored last year's conference, and many of the sponsors have uh, come forth this year with some sessions for all of you to attend, which is amazing. Um, so thank you so much to all of our sponsors. And I wanted to bring your attention to the career fair sessions. So this afternoon, starting at two o'clock, we have Unity is going to be doing a Q&A session. These links are on the, the uh, CanQuick web, web page, so you can go there and click on it. Some of them have a registration link. You can go ahead and register now. So Unity is going to be giving a Q&A session from 2 to 3 this afternoon. Electronic Arts has a Q&A session, so you can hear more about Electronic Arts from 5 to 6 tonight. And DeepMind, um, which is a Google uh, company, AI company, um, is having a Q&A session from four to five tonight. Okay, this is the one I want to draw special attention to because we had this wrong on the website earlier. We had said that it was on Friday. It's actually happening this afternoon at four o'clock. Um, so make sure you check out these sessions today and tomorrow we have Morgan Stanley, Uber and IBM. Um, and I guess that's about it for me. So if you have any questions, we'll stick around for a couple of minutes uh, and monitor the chat if you like. And otherwise, we'll see you back here at three o'clock for the panel session on careers. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks, everyone.